Here I've got a nice geometry problem that lives inside of the complex plane. And this was on a math contest given by the University of Carnegie Mellon in the United States. And it's from the year 2016. And finally, it was, it was suggested by Good Place to Stop. And I've also adapted this problem a little bit to generalize it. So let's suppose that omega is a complex number and lambda is a real number which is strictly greater than one. So in other words, it's on this interval from one to infinity. Furthermore, omega and lambda satisfy the following condition. Omega, omega squared, and lambda times omega form an equilateral triangle. And that equilateral triangle is living in the complex plane. And our goal is to find lambda as a function of omega. Okay, so let's maybe get a picture of this situation on the board, and then we'll go from there. So I've started our picture. I've got my complex plane. The real axis is running horizontally, and the imaginary axis is running vertically. So I've put my complex number omega in the first quadrant, but this could be generalized to any quadrant. Remember, this is just to get us thinking about some maybe like algebraic properties that are the relation between lambda and omega. Okay, so now that we've got omega, let's write down one of these other numbers in the complex plane. Maybe the easiest one to do will be lambda times omega. So since lambda is bigger than one, we know that lambda times omega will be on the positive ray emanating from the origin going through omega. So there's my ray from the origin going through omega. And again, because lambda is bigger than one, we know it's gonna be further out than omega. So I'll just put right here, this is lambda times omega like that. Okay, so that's looking good. And then omega squared will be related to omega in that it will have a square of the distance from the origin and the argument will be doubled. So here if theta is the argument of omega, then two theta will be the argument of omega squared. But furthermore, we know that this completes an equilateral triangle. So we can actually just like eyeball it and put omega squared maybe right about here. So here's omega squared, and we did that in a way so that we have something that looks pretty much like an equilateral triangle. Okay, so that's looking good. And now we're gonna use a well-known fact, and that is multiplication by a complex number is a similarity on the complex plane. So let's get that fact on the board. So like I just said, multiplying by a non-zero complex number is a similarity of the complex plane. In particular, the distances change by the modulus of z, and the angles change by the argument of z. So looking at our picture, there's probably an advantageous complex number to multiply by. And that advantageous complex number will be one over omega. And I guess I should have pointed out at the beginning that omega is not equal to zero. So we'll just add that in by saying that omega is in the non-zero set of the complex numbers. If we put a little x here, that's what that means. That's because it forms a multiplicative group. So let's see what multiplying by one over omega will do. So it'll rotate everything by negative theta. That's because it's one over omega. And then it'll scale everything by omega. So this will go to the point one on the real axis. This will go to the point lambda on the real axis. And then omega squared will become omega. Okay, so let's draw that picture over there. Okay, so we end up with the following triangle, which is nice now because it lives on this real axis. And since it lives on this real axis, we can talk about the measurement of these sides pretty easily. So notice the distance from one to lambda will be lambda minus one. And then since this is an equilateral triangle, all of these distances will all also be lambda minus one. So I'll just put one more in there, but this, this one right here is also lambda minus one or has length lambda minus one. Furthermore, we know the angle measure of all of these angles as well. So this angle will be pi over three or 60 degrees. Again, because that's an equilateral triangle. And now let's let that 
fill in the height of this triangle, which we can calculate with trigonometry. So let's notice that we know the sine of pi over 3 will be equal to this height, which I'll maybe call y, so let's put a y in here, over the hypotenuse, which is lambda minus 1. Furthermore, we know sine of pi over 3 is the square root of 3 over 2, so that's equal to y over lambda minus 1, telling us that y is equal to the square root of 3 over 2 times the quantity lambda minus 1. So we could maybe add that in here. So maybe I'll just do it like this. This is equal to the square root of 3 over 2 times lambda minus 1. And now that we've got that measurement made, we're actually ready to finish this thing off, but we need a little bit more room. So this is the picture that we ended up with on the last board, and now we have enough information to write a lambda as a function of omega. And in fact, not only will lambda be a function of omega, but it will be a function of the modulus of omega, or the distance from, of omega from the origin, which is maybe a little bit stronger of a condition. So in order to see that, we need to introduce another triangle into this situation. So the triangle will be in this peach color, so I'll draw it like this. So notice the hypotenuse has distance omega or measure omega. And then here this height is the square root of three over two times lambda minus one. And then we can figure out this distance as well, which is not too hard. And then this point right here will be the average of lambda and one. So that'll be lambda plus one over two. Now we've got a nice setup where we can apply the Pythagorean theorem to the triangle with these two side lengths and this guy as the length of the hypotenuse. So that's going to give us 3 over 4 times lambda minus 1 squared plus 1 over 4 times lambda plus 1 squared. So that's from squaring these two side lengths equals the magnitude or the modulus of omega squared. Okay, great. So now let's see if we can simplify this a little bit. This will give us three times lambda squared minus two lambda plus one plus lambda squared plus two lambda plus one equals four times the magnitude of omega squared. So I got that just by multiplying both sides of this equation by four. Okay, so now let's see if we can simplify a little bit. So I have three times lambda squared plus lambda squared. That gives me four lambda squared. And then I'll have minus six lambda plus two lambda. So that's gonna be minus four lambda. And then I have three times one plus one. So that'll be plus four. Again, that equals four times the magnitude of omega squared. And now we can see here that we have almost a perfect square binomial. If we subtract three from both sides, we will have a perfect square binomial. So let's do that. We'll have four lambda squared minus four lambda plus one equals four times the modulus of omega squared minus three. Then this factors like two lambda minus one quantity squared equals four times omega squared minus three. We can take the square root of both sides. We have two lambda minus one equals the square root of four times omega squared minus three. Here we'll take the positive square root, given that we want lambda to be positive and bigger than one, and now we're pretty much home free. So notice we get lambda equals one plus the square root of four times omega squared minus three all over two. And that would be like our expression of lambda in terms of omega. And that's a good place to stop.